For today's session, we are now heading toward the drafting phase of National Action Plan, NAP. We would like to gather insights and information from partner stakeholders and on how we can move forward despite facing the COVID-19. We would like to see if the OGP co-creation standards will be helpful in highlighting the important points and gather all the information needed. Um, so one of the things for uh, Malaysia is the fact that um, in terms of the concept of open government, it's not new. Um, Malaysia has embarked on a heavy uh, digitalization of government since to, uh, the early 2000s. Um, um, as such, um, at this stage, most of um, the government agencies are already highly, um, what do we call it, digitalized um, or have digital systems in place. Um, on, um, so on the openness side, um, however, um, since, um, since about 2014, um, Malaysia actually has a, um, what we call a, a digital master plan or digital government master plan. And um, part of the focus of um, uh, part of the focus on the digital master plan is actually uh, to provide better public services for um, uh, for citizens, uh, a citizen centric uh, approach to government, uh, as well as increased participation um, by citizens um, um, in terms of the citizen um, has a citizen focused approach uh, for Malaysia. Um, so, part of this, and I'll actually recap a few things uh, for Malaysia. So, uh, the, um, just for those who are not familiar, Malaysia has not been actually a part of the OGP. Um, so, in uh, says so, uh, so while it's not an official member of the OGP, and part of that is because we are a few points short um, in terms of the eligibility criteria. Um, mainly on asset declaration and the FOI. Um, as such, uh, a lot of these initiatives, um, which we would call open government, which we would categorize as kind of, kind of open government initiatives or uh, the same initiatives that are done by um, open government partners um, are being done in Malaysia, uh, but without the OGP context. Um, so, I'm just going to quite recap a few of these things that have, have been happening in Malaysia. So on the open data side in Malaysia, um, we actually have a public sector plan and a platform um, since 2014. Um, and the key focus on open data policy for Malaysia um, is on transparency um, to stimulate the digital economy, including innovations. Um, and um, and also to have uh, and also better delivery of um, digital services, not just between government to citizens, but also between government agencies, uh, between government agencies. Um, so this is, has been happening since 2014. Um, as a result of that, um, we there's a uh, there's an effort Can you called the, through to the Bunga Raya restaurant, please. Um, <laughs> Sorry, uh, we're, um, we're able to, uh, because of this, uh, there's, a, there's been a public sector uh, open data portal, which is at data.gov.my. Uh, uh, I was wondering, would, uh, would, you be, would I be able to make a booking for one table of about 14 people? Okay, cool. Sorry, I just muted. <laughs> um, sorry, uh, sorry for that interruption. So, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, just a recap on that. Um, what did I totally lost my track? <laughs> Hold on. Um, so since 2014, we do have an open data uh, portal in Malaysia. Um, do check it out at data.gov.my. It has done multiple iterations in terms of improvements. Um, originally, it started out just like a lot of other governments in the um, in the world, where the open data sets are mostly in PDF format, or there was not enough granul granularity in it. Um, but um, through uh, multiple iterations. So from 2014, uh, Malaysia does have a open data platform at data.gov.my. It has gone through multiple iterations, um, originally facing the same problems as most governments across the world in terms of what to publish. Um, uh, as a result, um, so the data sets now are a lot better. Um, 
um, now than it has been in, in the past. I'm um, just going to go through the next part here is the fact that uh, we also have um, since 2018, um, Malaysia uh, Mampu has started um, initial approaches with open contracting um, in terms of seeing how um, adoption of open contracting processes and the open contracting data standards um, can help improve um, procurement uh, for Malaysia. Um, so um, um, additionally, in 2018, um, the Malaysian government has also um, approached the World Bank in terms of a review of its um, open data approaches and what are the next steps. Um, so if you want to see um, in terms of what um, key strategies um, or deficiencies in Malaysia in terms of data sets um, from different um, uh, different sectors. Um, I recommend you look up or we'll share the link for the World Bank Open Data Readiness Assessment. Um, so um, keep going through that. Um, yeah, and also from our last webinar, uh, we've seen um, that uh, from our last webinar, we've seen that there's also um, sub-national initiatives um, that is being supported um, through the UK Global Digital Marketplace. Um, um, with their partners um, from Development Gateway um, in terms of additionally pre preliminary scoping studies on um, what, uh, what kind of improvements are needed in terms of improving procurement processes um, for at the sub-national level for Selangor government um, and what can be done at that stage. Um, additional um, partners that we, uh, and, um, other areas of focus uh, for open government in Malaysia um, include um, an open budget initiative um, by Ideas Malaysia, um, who did work uh, with the Ministry, uh, Ministry of Finance for a bit in terms of how to improve the budget for Malaysia, um, in terms of the budget openness in Malaysia. Sadly, there's still a lot of work to do in this case in terms of the budget transparency and participation in Malaysia. Um, on kind of uh, open legislative or open parliament side, um, in terms of the data openness for Malaysia, even though we don't have a specific open government initiative for parliament, uh, Malaysian parliament is surprisingly quite open um, relative to some of our neighbors, such as um, Indonesia, in ter um, even though we're not an OGP partner. Um, and since 2018, uh, end of 2018, um, I think um, the amount of um, information and uh, data and documents available on the Parliament website, um, including, for example, um, the voting um, attendance of parliamentarians are now actually published as part of the Hansard for Malaysia. Um, and I'm just going to go to the last part, which is the kind of the stumbling block in Malaysia in terms of our um, uh, of of our entrance into the OGP as a formal process. Um, and that is the fact that we lack the freedom of, uh, a national freedom of information enactment act. Uh, we do have FOI enactment acts in two sub-national government level, which is um, Selangor and Penang. Um, but we don't have one for the federal um, government. Um, and for this, there's some good news in the sense that the Center for Independent Journalism and the Department for uh, Justice, um, or I think they're commonly pronounced by you in Malaysia, have started the process, um, a participatory process in terms of drafting um, a possible Freedom of, Enactment, uh, Freedom of Information Enactment Act for Malaysia, uh, which includes uh, inputs from civil society, um, and as well as government agencies um, in terms of the development of this. Um, and the last update that I've heard from this from our colleagues at Center for Independent Journalism is the fact that um, there's, this process still is um, ongoing um, in terms of preparing the draft. Um, the tabling part might be a little bit up in the air because of Malaysia's um, uh, political climate, but the civil servants are going through the process along with civil society. Um, so this is one of the good things about this. There, so this is a good example in terms of the Freedom of Information Enactment Act of where uh, we actually have an open participatory process uh, for uh, the development of government policy, or in this case, government legislation, um, um, even though it's not called open government. Um, and to, to wrap it up, um, 
for all these different initiatives. So we've got open data and since 2014, and it's part of the government um, uh, plan for better service of public service del uh, delivery, which also includes um, you know, uh, a key focus on citizen participation and citizen-centric design. Um, we do have initial um, work on open procurement and actually uh, for open contracting, you can actually see some examples of that by the Malaysian team at Mampu, where they use um, not open data, but data from different government agencies um, to show examples of where um, infrastructure contracts, for example, schools and hospitals um, could use data to, for better policy planning, um, as well as even um, reduction in corruption by using open contracting data. Um, to track, for example, um, collusion um, and other red flags for procurement. Um, we have an open budget initiative through IDEARS that's just um, starting right now. Um, that uh, seems to work. We have a pretty good, we're in a pretty good place uh, for open legislative uh, data or access to parliament. Um, and the process for FI, FOI is going on. Um, unfortunately, um, and as part of our efforts here um, um, with, um, with at, at CNR Project is to see how we can coordinate all these efforts together um, under a more proper process, which is open government partnership, um, and how we can coordinate all these um, great efforts um, in terms of an actual commitment um, or a two-year national action plan, um, which is uh, a mechanism, a policy mechanism in OGP in which countries um, with civil society along with government, um, along with the executive, sit down and, and develop a two-year plan um, in terms of what key initiatives um, and targets that a country sh uh, or uh, our country should have um, in terms of commitments towards an open government. Um, and we're poised at a really good time right now because um, with COVID-19, um, it stressed the idea and the need for open data and, um, and an open government to respond um, to multiple um, issues that we face, um, social, economic, um, and, and health. Um, open government, open data, um, and civil society participation as well as transparency is extremely key. Um, and we hope that we, the national action plan that we were um, planning to draft um, with support and input from civil society and the government um, will set a roadmap for what we should try to achieve for the next two years um, as we deal as a country to um, deal with the challenges of COVID-19 um, and to do it in a collaborative and open manner. Um, and I think with that, um, I will kind of wrap up the summary for our stage right now um, and we'll get back and hopefully learn some um, 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 some best practices from our colleagues and friends in the Philippines on how they drafted their national action plan, uh, lessons that, uh, that they've learned and, and you know, possible um, uh, inputs into how we, should, uh, we could do it um, in Malaysia for our national action plan. So thank you. Um, the OGP articles of governance state that OGP participants commit to developing their action plans through a multi-stakeholder process with the active engagement of citizens and civil society. In order, to, in order to make open government reforms work, it is important that collaboration with citizens and with this requirement from OGP and other countries, the Philippines crafted its first co-created national action plan, the most recent NAP or NAP for the country, covering the period 2019 to 2021. So in 2011, an international movement for openness was established, which is called the Open Government Partnership or OGP. The Philippines is in fact one of the eight founding members of OGP, along with Brazil, Indonesia, Iraq, Norway, South Africa, the United Kingdom, and the United States. In a nutshell, OGP is a global effort to make government better. It aims to secure concrete commitments from governments to promote transparency, empower citizens, fight corruption, and harness new technologies to strengthen governance. Currently, OGP has grown to 78 countries representing a third of the world's population. 
To become a member of OGP, participating countries must endorse a high-level open government declaration, deliver a country action plan, and commit to independent reporting on their progress moving the current administration. The Philippines is remain firmly committed to OGP to revise commitments, and it is through these commitments to OGP principles that we have been able to lay strong foundations for our reform. In international peer learning activities, we are actually open as how and what makes OGP work in the Philippines. Our go-to answer would always be because of champions at different levels of government and also because the PHOG Secretariat is largely an influential agency which is the Department of Budget and Management, the DBM or the DBM. The DBM serves both as chair and secretariat of the Philippine OGP. OGP's value proposition is in its capacity to bring together stakeholders and create that space for constructive engagement, flourish, and with the end's inherent influence and mandate, make it a very strategic agency to house OGP. So it is important that um, OGP is housed in an agency that um, is influential across, across government. To show you the OG, the PH OGP structure, we have a government chairperson and non-government chairperson. Um, this is structured in a 50-50 capacity that is led by government on one side, our chairperson, and on the, the other side, it's the non-government who is the co-chairperson. This next slide shows us that government, we have the national government agencies, we also have local government, we have Congress, and then the chair and government secretariat is with the Department of Budget and Management, while for the non-government, we have civil society organizations, um, in, from the major island groups in the Philippines, we have the academic, private sector, and public sector. What is unique in the Philippines' OGP structure is the presence of secretariats, both at the government and the non-government um, side, that work hand-in-hand to support the NSF. Uh, um, according to the OGP, hand have the following or main action plan characteristics. That's the focus on significant open government priorities and ambitious reforms. It is relevant to the OGP values of access to information, civic participation, and public accountability and technology and innovation for openness and accountability. It has to contain specific time-bound and measurable commitment. The PHOGP map that was launched in December 2019 covers 10 commitments spread across 11 programs with 11 commitment agents, commitment holders, or commitment holders from government side and five non-government commitment holders. These are the following or the 11 um, programs across the 10 commitments as you can see. So in cracking the fifth map, we at the PHOGP steering committee imposed the following criteria to be followed for proposed OGP commitments um, as embedded in the main um, characteristics of an, of an action plan. It stretches the government beyond its current state or practice, significantly improves status quo, or it has high impact. It is with national government support or by team. The crafting of its commitment should be co-created with civil society. The focus thematic area is improving public service delivery, and milestones should be specific, clear, succinct, and complies with the smart criteria, which is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. This will guide you in choosing the commitment to include in the NAP. There could be more than one commitment, and in such case, um, you will have to prioritize. At such instance, it is important to check for commitments in the implementation period or the action plan period. So one that will be funded fully to ensure, it, to ensure its implementation is important, hence the buy-in or support from national government is essential. Because of UBM's inherent influence and that and as it also sits in many oversight and interagency committees and good governance, the PHOGP secretary was able to effectively lead the OGP narrative in key national government anchors and frameworks. These are the first three, or the, first, the, the first and the third bullet in this frame. Um, we have the Philippine Development Line and the Participatory Governance Cluster of the, of the Cabinet Performance and Projects Roadmap for 2017 to 2022. We have also as a key framework, resource or source, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and of course, from the OGP, Independent Reporting Mechanism for the Philippines. These are the 
recommend, the, the, the recommendations outlined in these key international and national government frameworks, policies, and publications were used in casting our action plan. Here is the action plan development process that the Philippines underwent in the creation of the fifth national action plan. The DBM, which is the government secretariat, and code and as the non-government secretariat made a desk review of the IRM findings in current line status, results, and previous of previous dialogues and consultations. They conducted initial brainstorming and technical discussions, after which regional consultations with non-government sectors that was um, that were conducted in November and December for inclusion in the next um, OGT citizens agenda which was submitted to government agencies. The citizen agenda contains draft commitments proposed for adoption by identified and potential agency commitment holders before another round of regional consultations commenced from June to September of 2019. This is also the first time that PHOGP conducted a bottom-up approach in consultation with its stakeholders to make the fifth NAP fully a co-created and citizens-driven action plan. Compared to previous NAPs, the current action plan development timeline lasted for 13 months with the widest geographical and sectoral reach with activities facilitated by both government and non-government secretariats and all members of the PH OGP steering committee assuming a more proactive role in the process. So we have until its um, public launch, which um, ha um, ha happened in December 2019, that is the development of the action plan process. The next slide we can see the commitment template where we can we will find the commitment name, the program name, action plan duration or time frame, the lead implementing agencies, and the commitment description. So the commitment description tells us what uh, identifies what the public problem that the commitment will address, what is the commitment, how will this commitment contribute to solve the public problem, why is the commitment relevant to OGP values, and additional information. Also, in, in that commitment template, we see the milestones and deliverables, as shown in this table, where each milestone activity has a verifiable deliverable. There is the midterm deliverable, the end of term deliverable, the mental verification of the start date and the end date. And then, of course, it is important to include the contact information of accountable senior officials and designated technical focal person both from the government commitment holder and the non-government commitment holder. As we went along the drafting of the National Action Plan, and which was launched in December 2019, as we continue to implement starting in January of this year, we have a few successes. Uh, among these are the bottom-up approach in crafting the open government agenda and commitment as opposed to the previous last consultation. As mentioned earlier, um, instead of um, the action plan with commitments coming from agency themselves, which are sent out to non-government partners for, for, consult, uh, for comments and consultation, um, what we did in the fifth um, national action plan is to have that citizen agenda, whereby a bottom-up approach is um, employed. Then also there is extensive consultation done nationwide, as mentioned earlier, the review of commitments to ensure that they address OGP values and result the transformative impact. CSO initiated commitments were also included, um, examples of which are the, the Department of Education, the Department of Social Welfare and Development, the, the NPIP or the Indigenous Peoples, the National Commission of Indigenous Peoples, and then support from OGP during committee members, both from the government and the non-government side. A few challenges along the way were shown on screen. Um, converting issues that are not directly anchored in OGP values or that are too broad into something that can be considered as an OGP commitment. For example, um, recognizing the rights of IPs, challenges in IPs or indigenous peoples, challenges in public contracting that result in delay in traffic implementation. Another challenge is cascading of information. There is a need to raise awareness on OGP at the local level and sustaining non-government participation in the co-creation process and in monitoring of commitments. So with respect to open response policy in the Philippines under fiscal openness, we were able to publish data on budget allocations and expenditures for emergency response and revenue sources 
Uh, we were able to ensure that vulnerable communities and educated with spending priorities. We have the social amelioration program of the DSWD, and then the open data where we publish information on aid commitments, receipts, and expenditures, among others. The OGP Guide to Open Government and Coronavirus provides a rich source of best practices on how open government projects can support tackling the pandemic. So let's be practical. Why engage in OGP? What gives? OGP is a very potent platform for convergence towards better, more meaningful and results. Government workforce is multiplied in the process. There's a government and civil society interaction, there's government, government interaction, there's the government, the civil society, the private sector, and development partners. Communicating the funds to citizens and closing feedback, feedback loops, which is available in off, on, offline or online means, and then building mutual trust between government and citizens, between and among government institutions. So what? Why open government? The, the government exists to serve the people. OGP is a platform for people-centered approaches, programs, and advocacies. An open government is a government that lives Through opening up its processes, government can restore people's faith in public institutions when we respond to the demands of citizens and the private sector to increase transparency, integrity, accountability, and stakeholder participation. A government that responds using citizen feedback and governance will help government design and implement responsive and targeted policies and programs for its people, which in turn promote sustainable and inclusive socioeconomic development in a government that is felt. An empowered citizen we can serve as multipliers of the government workforce in the whole governance cycle from planning, implementation, energy, and accountability. OGP is a platform that can be tapped to change culture of governance, to bring the right people in a common and safe space to discuss public problems and how to work on addressing them together. But then, at, but at the end of the day, as OGP is only a platform, it can only be as strong as we make it. Okay, I will read out a question for Clarissa. What's a good process in terms of starting initial group of participants to start NAP process? How to identify them? Which one is suitable for the during the process? Yes, thank you. During the consultation process, we reached out to our non-government um, um, secretariat. Um, they were able. They have um, a directory of all um, CSOs or non-government partners, where we across regions. So we were able to, do, to identify which of these um, civil society organizations and non-government um, organizations to include or to invite into the our, our normally um, in partnership with the agencies that would want to participate or to um, provide a commitment for the action plan. The ones that would want to submit a commitment for the national So for Kyril, there's a question from Robin. Uh, are there concrete action to address these challenges on uh, some participation shortcomings we are experiencing in Malaysia currently to be a member of OGP? So where we are in the stage right now? Um, okay, so the, um, um, so the, uh, the civil service uh, or MAPU, which um, is actually uh, kind of one of the initiators within civil service um, in terms of starting the participation of OGP. Um, they've initially um, um, made a request um, to OGP in terms of, you know, um, what Malaysia needs to become part of OGP. Uh, the two key stumbling blocks um, was, um, as I shared before, was the lack of a Freedom of Information Enactment Act. Um, and the second was uh, on public asset decoration. Uh, most recently, um, uh, most recently, even though um, with the last government that we have, um, even though we had um, in initial strides in terms of making um, the declarations of public officials, at least um, parliamentarians public, um, that apparently um, was not good enough um, yet for OGP in terms for us to have that um, criteria ticked off. Um, so in terms of uh, concrete efforts in dealing with this, um, 
um, the key stumbling block for Malaysia uh, participation right now is one is um, the Freedom of Information Act. Um, that that is if we have that tabled um, or, or even as a complete draft that's ready for tabling. Um, that would actually put us over the minimum eligibility score because we actually are doing quite well in the other areas. Uh, and on this stage, um, as I shared before, um, Malaysia actually has started that, pro um, that process um, with the legal services department, um, as long, uh, along with civil society, which is um, the Center for Independent Journalism, um, to actually start the process of uh, drafting that law. Um, so we actually, um, at this stage right now, um, we're continuing at least the civil servants at, um, uh, at the legal uh, affairs division um, or the legal affairs department um, and, and civil society are still continuing with trying to improve and um, going through the process of finalizing that um, F FOI enactment act. Um, um, but yeah, <laughs> in Malaysia right now, we are in a kind of a uh, bit of a turmoil in terms politically. Um, um, so getting support from the executive might be a little bit difficult at this stage, but at least civil society and um, the civil service will continue to, to work on um, the policy aspects um, in terms of public service delivery, going through the process of um, getting ready, uh, you know, a bill for Freedom of Information Act. Uh, ready so sh so that um, should um, the executive um, uh, feel that they need to support uh, or push the process through where Malaysia becomes eligible that we have these processes in place that allow us to be eligible uh, for OGP um, and which is why we're also starting the national action plan process um, so again we want to go through um, understanding you know what the, the barriers are and starting with trying to come up with our own national action plan following OGP processes um, uh, in, in parallel to um, the actual um, process of being eligible for OGP whether that is ha um, whether like how far that is or not um, we still will continue um, and this NEP process is part of that process of trying to keep working on the building blocks needed um, for an OGP implementation in Malaysia, um, while we kind of sort out and wait for uh, how the executive is going to deal um, with the actual uh, submission from the government of Malaysia. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> so, okay, next uh, for Clarissa, how OGP Philippine prioritize the initiative or policies that can align with the open response just now? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, what we usually do is, um, since the OGP NAP has been drafted um, last year, so what we are doing right now is to try to, to check in with the commitment holders and how they are doing with their um, milestones or activities, how this is related to, um, to the response to the pandemic. Um, since there is um, uh, the implementation of the action plan is actually extended for another year, what agency commitment holders and non-government commitment holders are trying to do is to try to put in activities which can be included in the action plan as a commitment that relates to um, response to the pandemic. Uh, other than that, there is a conscious um, effort across government agencies to provide for um, a platform where we can have open government or we can still practice open government in, um, in agency um, implementation of its programs and activities related to the to response to the pandemic. So there are feedback mechanisms in government agency websites or portals. There is a platform available either through social media or through the um, the FOI, we have an EFOI um, website where um, the public can provide uh, inputs, and open government can um, uh, at least thrive in in this um, instance. Um, as mentioned in in the slide earlier, there is actually a specific response to 
physical openness that we have been doing. So other than that, um, in other areas of government work, um, we try to put in um, initiatives and policies that can align to open the fund. I have here my colleague, is, um, Robin Dumatin, who is actually joining me in this um, webinar. He can provide also a um, response to some of the questions that he can add to, to my response. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Yes. Yeah. yeah, good afternoon. If if I may if I may add to what yeah, yeah. Uh, Miss Miss Claire have said, uh, related to my questions to Kay Kyrie really earlier. Uh, I think it uh, I, I, I already included it in the chat box, but to reiterate, it would also be helpful to identify champions in open government to your parliament, especially in the executive branch, so that there will be a push from uh, those open government champions to develop your own to, to to be a member and to, to to develop the open government principles in 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 uh, Malaysia and also with respect to the FOI um i think uh in our case here in the philippines uh we have not yet uh we have not yet um the, we are not yet done with with the legislation part of our freedom of information, is it is still being uh, pushed in Congress. But what we are doing right now in in aid of the freedom of information law, uh, our FOI team is uh, going around the country to uh, advocate and let the local government units uh, push for their own FOI ordinances. So from there, um, our open our our LGU would have uh, concerted efforts to push to our legislators to have the Freedom of Information Bill uh, to be passed into law. That's all. I want to ask that uh, how you measure that this action plan will give incentive to the Philippine government will, while following this uh, action plan that you guys have had now? Are you guys getting money or compensation in return for following this uh, action plan? Um, if, if I may answer, uh, Ms. Claire, yep. uh, in terms of incentives, um, currently the, the way of incentivizing our commitment holders, especially the government commitment holders, are um, on, on the concept of uh, we can always lobby and help them to push their initiatives in the action plans to request for funding requirement during the budget preparation. So uh, it, it, it can further help them to, to justify the need to provide funding for their, accomplish, for their commitment since it is, first, it is a commitment of the government in the international and it would be as, uh, power, uh, it would be as good as uh, possible if uh, th those commitments will still be pushed with uh, the government agencies. In in fact, in our previous action plan, uh, one of the one of the commitments that we that the, our agencies lobbied for a uh, funding requirement is the uh, last mile school, the establishment of the last mile school for the Department of Education. So. Uh, the, the Department of Education justified that uh, uh, as a commitment in the Philippine Open Government Partnership, last mile school were able to uh, to to get a funding of uh, roughly I think it's five billion that will help them push for uh, their initiatives in the last mile school. I see. Okay. So, if anybody else have any questions. Sorry, I have a question for <laughs> OGP um, Philippines. Um, um, when um, so, was there any guidelines or criteria that we can kind of uh, follow in Malaysia in terms of um, kind of best practices for um, this the selection of um, or identification of which government um, agencies are would be good or programs within government agencies and also in terms of civil society. Um, so I noticed from the slides there is a you know, key core group of government agencies and then as well as a core group of civil society. Um, how did you um, do this process, um, uh, both from the government side and also civil society in terms of um, 
um, engaging or deciding to have uh, these as the key groups. So, yeah, yeah okay. Uh, Miss Claire, if, if I may also add, if, if I may answer the question. So as mentioned by Ms. Claire earlier, so what's unique with the fifth national action plan that we are currently implementing right now is the presence of, an, of a bottom-up approach. Uh, where in our previous uh, national action plans, we initially the government selects the programs or activities or the commitments that they wanted to be part of the action plan. And those commitments is subject, uh, subjected to consultations with the with our non-government stakeholders across the across the country and with that we therefore uh, realized that there is a need for a more citizen citizen uh, civil society based uh, commitments wherein we uh, we um, we first do the desk review of the of the findings of on our RIM and on the find on the results of our previous national action plans. So from there, uh, we, our non-government secretariat led a discussion, a uh, con regional consultation to, with, with the civil society, the non-government organizations, and asked them what are the uh, priorities or what they think would best uh, uh, help in, in prioritizing the national action plan for the Philippines. So the, the result of that is the citizens, uh, OGP citizens agenda. So that agenda uh, uh, government agencies for, uh, we identify the government agencies that will best, uh, will best implement the citizens agenda from the, cit from the citizens. And um, from there, the government provided a response through a draft national action plan. So from those uh, uh, draft national action plan, we circulated it another, to another round, uh, another round of civil society consultation across the, front, across, the front, across the country and to subject this to further scrutiny of the citizens. So uh, I, from there, we think that uh, going through the bottom to the top approach made us more uh, made, made us realize that this is a more citizens-driven action plan for the country. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, that's quite helpful for us um, in terms of insights on how we should do it, it um, how we should do that process as well um, for uh, formulation. So another question is, uh, how the civil society or the government agencies respond when you guys approach them to join these commitments? Do they hesitate to work with the government agencies? We've actually, uh, our is, uh, there is a demand from the citizens to include this in the national action plan. And we also help them craft the national action plan of the agency so that um, uh, these action plans will uh, be ready to be uh, consulted with the civil society um, organizations. Okay. So as, 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 a, as a response, um, we actually don't have much problem with regard to um, uh, private sector reaction or response when it comes to, to OGP. Uh, most of these um, CS and non-government organizations are actually active in, in their um, engagement with government, so it was not really um, difficult for us to engage them during the consultation process, as from what um, Robin said earlier. Okay, has anyone else have any question to ask them? Um, uh, if, if I may, I know, if I may just add, uh, I think in, in our in our case in the Philippines, one thing that works best is uh, the unique uh, the unique way of having our Philippine Open Government Partnership is the presence of uh, government and the non-government secretariat. So um, those two secretariats are the driving uh, force to keep the two entity work together. So we have the government secretariat that pushes the government agencies to be uh, active and take part in the open government partnership and as well as our non-government secretariat to convene 
the the network the CSO networks to also participate and take action in the OGP action plans. Carrie, if you want to add something. Yeah. So uh, I actually listed a whole lot of different initiatives. We've actually done a process here in Malaysia um, in terms of trying to map out. Um, we'll actually publish this document um, either soon after this webinar or on our newly, we're going to be launching a website um, probably on Monday um, to actually list down um, all the efforts that we've gone so far for to have open government um, in Malaysia. Um, so what uh, we would like to have as, as for those of us of Malaysians listening in, um, listening in um, whether you're a government agency or a, your civil society or even just a member of the public, um, if, if we would like to keep on coordinating and uh, find out more about what initiatives are there outside. So one of the things that we found out um, through the process here in Malaysia is that because uh, open government partnership um, wasn't, um, how to describe it, in the public spotlight in Malaysia in terms of policy or, uh, or use, um, there's a, actually a lot of initiatives that are considered would be coming under open government and are often included in the national action plans of different countries. Um, it's just that in Malaysia, we don't call it open government. <laughs> um, so um, as a result of that process, we've been trying to collect um, quite a lot in terms, of, in terms of our mapping documents of all the different um, government agencies and um, services that are um, doing Government, um, open government initiatives. Um, so do look forward, and I think the moderators will share that we will have a website open. Um, we and they'll, uh, I think the moderator um, Hafsa will also share um, as well links, um, and we'll do that as well through our social media on how you can get involved in um, being part of um, this drafting process. Um, and provide your feedback into uh, the drafting process for a national action plan in Malaysia. So, okay, I think uh, from the OGPPH side, do you guys have any, I mean, advice or uh, any suggestion that you can uh, tell us before we wrap up this session? Well, and part of the Philippine Open Government Partnership, of course, we are thankful for uh, inviting us to share our experience. I hope this is not the last, and uh, I hope to have more uh, collaborations with the Malaysian Open Government. The, the, the way I, I see it, uh, open governance is really up, uh, actually uh, present in Malaysia. So it's just some sort of um, uh, making it more, uh, more, making it more felt by the citizens and I think Kyril is uh, really uh, I think on the right track and uh, pushing for the move to make this possible. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, I think we have one more question to Kyril uh, or Claire and Robin. In the All Malaysian right. political situation now, I think the government offices might not really willing to work with the civil society. What the advice of you? How should we approach these government offices to cooperate with us in drafting the NAP? Okay. Um, okay, to share our experience for Malaysia, um, actually for a CNAR project, uh, we've been engaging um, with government even since before, uh, even under more authoritarian governments, uh, like since 2015. Um, what we've learned is the fact that when um, it, in terms of engaging with government, we're working with existing um, so-called government policy and master plans. Um, so when we're working with government um, um, departments in Malaysia, for example, um, we look at what are the existing policies. And I did share earlier um, in my summary that in Malaysia, we, we actually have a digital government master plan. Um, so for me, when I'm approaching government, it's like working through uh, policies uh, guidelines and even directives that are already in place um, towards these sort of initiatives like citizen participation and so on. Um, earlier before we started our conversation, for example, um, we had kind of a brief screenshot of like what's, uh, how should one conduct public participation, you know, a code of conduct and so on. Um, 
what's interesting to know about these sort of things is that yes, the Malaysian government in trying to actually do this in Cambridge actually has their own code of conduct already. Um, so yeah, so so my so what we're doing in CNR project as long as with other civil society is to keep engaging the uh, public service um, and then to support them through existing directives, um, uh, guidelines and policies that they already have to be implemented that, and that has already been um, endorsed um, or signed off on by the executive. Um, in this, so in this sort of situation, um, there's no, um, how to say, there's less pressure um, in terms of pushing for something new to get approved, which may, or, uh, which may be difficult. Um, rather instead map out what they're already doing that is open government related, which they already have a mandate for. Um, and in this case, uh, when we engaged with them on this sort of um, level, um, it's not, it doesn't become um, confrontative. It doesn't become an issue of, um, you know, needing additional uh, approval, uh, approval from the higher ups. Um, and simply becomes a, a much easier working um, collaboration where um, both civil society and the public service agencies are. We're just basically helping them to deliver um, their public service better. Um, and by engaging with them, um, we are actually also uh, supporting their, what we call KPIs, in terms of better civil society engagement or public participation. Uh, so yeah, well, so our approach right now is through this win-win um, approach or collaborative approach with policies that are already existing um, in which uh, and where there's already a budget and where there's already a need to implement well so yeah and that's our current approach um, um, in you know in in Malaysia where it's understandably there's a kind of because of the political uncertainty that um, civil servants or public agencies might be a little bit hesitant to work with civil society um, or um, yeah okay so if uh, Clarissa, you want to add anything? Yes, or Robin, Clarissa is gone now. <laughs> uh, yeah, all right. I think yeah, Clarissa is having, yeah. yes, uh, having a yeah. problem connection. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Kyriel. Uh, it is also important also to look at the touch points where there is an existing entry from the civil society and the government. So from there, at least there will be a common ground between the civil society and then the government agencies. Um, if, if I may reiterate, I, I mentioned earlier that it would also be helpful to identify champions in open government because they will help you in pushing good, government re good governance reforms. And if I may also add, it would also be helpful to build coalitions among the civil society organizations to create for the demand that the government would see that there's a need for a more collaborative work between the government and its citizens. So yeah, I, I think uh, Kyril uh, was able to uh, touch those topics. Thank you. Um, yeah, I actually forgot one more thing that I added was the fact that um, because Malaysia has been kind of um, isolated from the Open Government Partnership, um, is the fact that we we have not been able to actually engage internationally with this larger um, open government partnership community, um, both civil society, but also um, other governments in terms of collaboration. Um, so one other incentive that I see here um, is, um, again, actually it was raised by our colleagues in the Philippines in the slides that um, having, um, how to describe it, um, Part of the incentives is that if we uh, greater exposure and collaboration um, internationally for the efforts um, of of the different uh, efforts in Malaysia. Um, so uh, another approach that um, I would, as part of the things that we would like to facilitate at Senior Project as part of this uh, OGP effort, is um, things like this webinar where we're actually start introducing the public servants to colleagues internationally who are part of the open government partnership, such as our colleagues in the Philippines, Indonesia, um, um, in, in, for example, Kenya and other, um, 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 other members of the OGP, where we're now part of the international community to, uh, to deal with um, the problems that we do, but also to also share the experiences in Malaysia. 
um, in terms of what we're doing here um, and be part of this larger collaborative um, community internationally. Okay, so I think we are done with all the presentation and the question. I think Kyra can wrap up on our next step on the NAP timeline. Okay, um, so uh, for Malaysia, um, our next move, um, or we're, that's, this is the reason why we're getting feedback from our, um, or inputs from our Philippine colleagues, is, um, is what should we do next um, and what's the best way of doing it. Um, so our next steps here at Senior Project is we're going to start um, reaching out to government agencies, um, civil servants, um, um, elected representatives, um, to to find out who uh, or to, to find out to both introduce them more about what OGP is about if they haven't heard about it yet. Um, we've actually prepared a uh, policy briefing for them. Um, and also to engage with them and to who is will be interested in being part of an initial committee um, to to start working and drafting a national action plan. Um, so the immediate um, next steps for the next few weeks would be us launching um, a website to share these initiatives um, and on how others can participate. Um, and also we're also planning a initial workshop um, towards the end of July. Um, where we would come with would be the first um, workshop where civil society, um, um, government agencies, and as um, you know, elected representatives can um, join in and start working out towards um, our initial draft or uh, of the national action plan. So, so yeah, so I look forward to this. Um, Announcements, um, you can follow us on social media, Twitter at CNR Project, or, uh, at, at CNR Project um, on Facebook, um, as well as our upcoming website, which we'll announce um, on Monday. Okay, with that, uh, we thank everyone for joining in. We will send out all the material used for today's webinar for your future reference. And thank you again for joining us. We'll see you in the next series. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Robin and Clarissa. Yeah. Thank you. Hope Thank to you. hope to work with you soon in the near future.